Okay, so the next one is our classic Tonglen, which is an old favorite, I think, of all of us. Um, so in short, both directly and indirectly, do I offer every happiness and benefit to all my mothers. I shall secretly take upon myself all their harmful actions and suffering. So this secretly part is indicating Tonglen, giving and taking practice to take on myself all their harmful actions and suffering means to give the hardship I'm experiencing back to where it came from, which is the self-cherishing thought. My pain and agitation and feeling of being wronged came from self-cherishing. So I'm gonna give all of the pain of it back to self-cherishing. And so this Tonglen attitude is one that comes up in Lojong again and again. But to offer every happiness and benefit then is to offer your roots of virtue, to offer happiness in its causes, all your positive karma, all the benefit that you've created yourself, only have you created it all by yourself. You know, everything good that you've ever done that will result in happiness and result in resources is interdependent. You know, it's learned, there was many causes and conditions, so because of your mothers, you were able to develop good karma. So give the result of that good karma back to your mothers, meaning all mother sentient beings or all sentient beings who have at one point been our mother. Yeah. So, okay, so those are the two parts of that one. We've, we're talking giving and taking. We're talking recognizing every sentient being as having been our mother because of the mother archetype as having been the kindest one, whether that's the case or not, we're taking that as the example, right? But the giving and taking attitude is something that should be done in a stealthy, quiet way, yeah? So secretly indicates on the breath, but secretly also indicates anonymous, anonymously, yeah? And I think this can be useful practice for us, even if we're doing something as simple as, I don't know, making a charitable donation to Doctors Without Borders or something. You know, when you're writing your check to Doctors Without Borders, do we still write checks? I don't know what we do. You know what I mean? Like you're doing your donation and instead of, you know, ticking the box for, I would like a free handbag with my donation, or I would like to be on the list of donors, you're just anonymous. Like, just kind of like feel what that does to your ego. How about I just do good and no one knows it was me? How about I just do the right thing because it's good to do the right thing? You know, and just kind of like feel your ego's response to that. What is the need to be acknowledged? What is the need to be, you know, respected? What is the need to be celebrated? You know, do you need applause for every good thing that you do? You know, why is it not enough just to feel happy to have done it? So, I mean, I think we're on board with that, but then how easy is it to start to feel resentful if people seem to be taking your goodwill for granted? You know, maybe you've been volunteering somewhere for years and you've just been doing it quietly under the radar, no one's acknowledged you and you love it and you do it because you love it and it's important but no one really has noticed you all those years and your part of you is kind of like really nobody nobody's noticed <laughs> you know there's part of you that can kind of get that little bit of like <laughs> you know what i mean which is so human and totally natural and normal but to kind of like catch what is the part of that that is logical and what is the part of that that is afflicted you know the need to be seen or the need to be acknowledged. So uh, this kind of stealth bodhisattva work is, is really vital. And it's that verse is kind of the summary of everything that came before. It's like with seeing all sentient beings as a treasure, with viewing yourself at the lowest of all, with offering the victory, with being vigilant, all of the things, you're doing it quietly internally. Yeah. And you might talk about your practice with really close Dharma friends when you're trying to workshop stuff, you know, and debrief and stuff. 
But generally speaking, you're not one of those people who's going around saying, guess what brilliant thing I've just learned about life and humanity and you should all do it too. And I'm, I'm amazing and insightful and you could all be amazing and insightful too if you just figured this out, you know. You know, like someone who's on a new diet and is telling everyone about their new diet and wants them all to do it. <laughs> You know, and you're like, that's great. I'm glad that you're getting healthy. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm glad that kale is working for you. Don't feed it to me every meal. <laughs> you know, it's your business. So there's something kind of freeing about this attitude of like secrecy or stealth or quietness. Because then also no one notices when you fail. <laughs> so it takes the pressure off. Um, but it also kind of gives you this everyday present moment clarity that asks, what can I do to undermine my self-cherishing today? And some days what I'm able to do is remarkable. And I know that given my life and given my history, that was amazing work. No one else is going to know how amazing it is because they haven't been with you your whole life watching all of your trials and tribulations. You know, so you're giving yourself your own. Wow, that was that was some good work today. You know, even a few years ago, I would have lost the plot. Nice, nice bodhicitta, <laughs> you know, right? You're just kind of quietly like feeling satisfied that your practice is taking hold. If you're broadcasting your practice, you're also kind of inviting observation. Yeah, you're inviting people to say, oh, nice bodhicitta, yelling at your kids, <laughs> you know, yeah. So, so there's a, an outside benefit and there's an inside benefit, you know, yeah. And see how it goes, but yeah, what is this, how does this one land, this idea of, giving and taking practice quietly, anonymously. How does it land to imagine your practice is so private? Yeah. You can look on the other hand, what, why is it that you don't want it to be private sometimes? Because there's, there's fine and lovely enthusiastic reasons to share. You know, I've been learning this and I'm excited about this and I'm reading that. There's beautiful kind of enthusiastic for Dharma reasons to share. But there's also reasons that are kind of, look at me, I'm a very good person. <laughs> you know, shine the spotlight on me. You know, and it can become even a bigger ego than before because now it's a spiritual practitioner ego. Eek. Right? It's like the worst. Yeah. And, you know, and you'll see it with new Buddhists maybe more often, but it can happen to us all. Yeah, Joanne. Sometimes when I'm keeping my practice very private or thinking about it, if I do it for like a, a length of time, I lose a sense that I'm part of a community. Mm. And, yeah, that's, that's the thing because when you're sharing at least some of your practice with your dharma group dharma buddies yeah. you feel like you belong it's a bigger a bigger thing yeah but if i'm keeping it private then sometimes i lose that sense of community like i'm here yeah. on my own yeah it's a good point and uh, you know even more you know poignant now with uh lockdown and pandemic stuff and all of this you know where we're really pretty isolated yeah. i think it's the question of with whom are you sharing and what are you sharing and why? I, I don't know that it's sharing itself that's the problem. I, I think it's the reasons why. So it's like with some of my nun friends, I might say, I tried this and it didn't work. I tried that and it did work, you know, discuss. <laughs> How does it go for you when you do such and such? And you really are just trying to like workshop it, you know? Yes, yes. And that's the sort of thing I enjoy. Yes. Totally. And I think we need to, and I think we have to share our practice with people that are also practicing and really, you know, going through the same thing that we are. It's, it's kind of just how do we avoid then virtue signaling, you know, like going too far with it and being like, 
oh, the other day, so-and-so was so awful and I really was able to blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, it's going too far and it's going into like praising oneself and criticizing others and, you know, kind of going down the wrong road. And it could be the same exact statement is excellent if it's coming from the place of just genuinely celebrating some positive change. And those yeah. same words could be ego-driven seeking praise. Yeah. You know, so it's not really even the words. It's like what was behind it. Yeah. I think at my level, that's unavoidable on a regular basis. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. But if I, can, if I can see it, then that's good. Yeah. Yeah. And you got to keep your sense of humor. Like if you're sharing the good parts of your path, then don't shy away from sharing the difficult parts, you know. Aww. You know, <laughs> you don't have to give all of your worst faults and all of your, you know, fails, you know, your epic fails of Dharma. But, you know, if you're saying this is going really well, say, but then again, the other day I lost it with blah, blah, blah. And how can I keep my mindfulness in that situation where I always lose it? You know? mm. Yeah. And it's, but it's, sharing, you know, sharing the, the fails, you can get input from other people about maybe how to do it better next time too yeah yeah and you know as as dharma friends it's like we need to really hold each other in such reverence and respect because the sangha of course you know generally is monks and nuns ultimately is people with a realization of emptiness but generally is the whole community you know in a kind of general way and without the community there aren't teachings or a teacher you know, it's yeah. like we don't really have the merit by ourselves to have however many hours this is of this conversation without each other, right? Yeah. And and so it's it's kind of this, we really are in it together. And so let's train in creating a safe enough atmosphere to fall on our face in front of each other, you know, and just like to make a big mistake, to be ridiculous, to be able to own it. You know, and what can happen in all religious communities, all spiritual communities, and even secular communities that are focused on transformation, maybe psychology or whatever, is almost the pressure of the ideals makes you unable to share your own failings. Oh, yeah. You know, whereas maybe with your regular friends who have no particular path, you can just be totally honest and say, I lost it yesterday about blah, blah, blah. And they're like, oh, yeah, I do that all the time, you know, cup of tea. And it's fine. But with your Dharma friends, you're like humiliated because the pressure of the ideals is like, you know, pressing down on you. And then, you know, people in the communities can feel even less safe than usual to be human. And make human mistakes and have human inconsistency so it's like we want to somehow celebrate the ideals aspire to the ideals while at the same time being so open and transparent about the fact that we're nowhere close to being bodhisattvas oh yeah it gives us joy to think such a thing is possible mm. not to have the pretense that we should already be there just because we can explain it well yeah you know yeah. And so that's, I think, something that we can actively do as a community is to try and create that really safe atmosphere to fall on the face and to admit it. And, you know, that the atmosphere of self-awareness and self-reflection is such the default mode that people aren't judging you mm -hmm. and that you're not judging them. Yeah. It's, it's really hard to create that in a spiritual community. It's hard to create it in any community, I think, where you're aspiring to something. Mm. When you're a beginner, you can be kind of open about, I don't get this, or I miss the connection between this and that. Mm. But as soon as you've been doing it for a while, you can feel this pressure of, I should know this by now, or I should be good at this by now. Oh, yeah, I definitely have that. Yeah. Yep. And um, I'm just finishing up uh, with, you know, my Israeli group. Their first cohort is in their seventh year. They're almost done with a seven-year program of psychoanalysis and Buddhism and humanities. And a few of them were brave enough to say, after seven years, I think I can start. <laughs> you know, like, after seven years, maybe I should start having a daily practice. 
you know, like uh, theoretically this whole time they've had a daily practice. They've been doing all sorts of meditations and retreats. But after seven years, some of them are being honest enough to say, yeah, I could probably sit every day. That would be good for me, wouldn't it? Maybe just mindfulness on the breath. Maybe nothing even more than that. Five, ten minutes. <laughs> you know, but it like took them seven years to work up to that. Yeah. It's so human, right? It, it takes a while for us to be convinced that's and to really have, right. yeah, that's right, right. And, yeah, and to have enthusiasm and for it to be genuine and not forced. Because mm -hmm. the last thing we want to do is treat our practice like a chore. Mm. you know because if it's a chore then we'll lose the joy of it and then in our next life we won't be as drawn to it because it's got that like association of stress mm -hmm. you know so yeah. it's like what what do you need to do to kind of keep the joy of it i mean remember sometimes we used to have courses where the breaks and the lunch were like as long as the course remember right? like we'd have like a, you know an, a half hour of teaching and then like a half hour of morning tea and then like an hour of lunch and you know the food part was like as much as the teaching part because that's what you need in order to digest and integrate this really epic material yeah you know yeah. so yeah whatever you can do to to cultivate that um the sharing in the right way as opposed to the advertising virtue signaling i am a good person please pat me on the head vibe you know more just a kind of celebration hey look this works and sometimes it doesn't because i misunderstand or i forget <laughs> and that's fine mm -hmm. right yeah. thank you yeah yeah other thoughts about this verse seven it's a it's a doozy, the secretly, the anonymously, the giving and taking quietly. And to see all sentient beings as your mothers while doing so in the way that's useful and going to conjure up some sense of kindness and affection. <laughs> yeah. Because this is really what's meant. Whenever we see mothers peppered all over the Dharma, we're asking ourselves, how can I feel genuine affection? Yeah, positive regard, affection and respect. What do I need to say to myself to view sentient beings in that light? Yeah, Heather, did you have something? This is, um, this actually feels the most accessible for some reason of all of them. And, and I, I wonder, it's, um, I, I don't know a better way to say it than there's like sort of the the heaven part of my practice and the earth part of my practice. And this feels more like the heaven part where it's kind of quiet and, you know, just beautiful. It's just really clear why you would want to do this. And then, then it's like, I imagine like a spaceship coming back to earth and just blowing up as soon as it hits the stratosphere atmosphere wherever they blow up if they're not at the right angle it's like when you try to apply that to or you know and that that's where it's um yeah i mean if i could just be in a quietly practicing by myself all the time for the benefit of people that just sounds like a dream that sounds wonderful it just it seems like it's hard to um you know now get up and log off zoom and go live my the rest of my life you know so yeah yeah we're with you and, and maybe because this verse is is kind of like the default practice or the proactive practice and the other verses for the most part are like when things go wrong here's a way to think about it when things go wrong here's a way to think about it when things go wrong when things go wrong you know and it's like well sometimes things go wrong and they get to us and sometimes they don't get to us, you know, and what's the way to keep the mind protected and healthy. So almost in a way that you don't need all the other verses because you're so familiarized, you agree, you're on board with it. And so that's your premise. When things happen, that's how I'm going to think about it. So now my daily life, giving and taking, giving and taking, you know, love, mm -hmm. compassion, love compassion and when you stay in that it does protect your mind from being rattled by everything else you don't need to stop and say 
I should offer the victory, see myself as the lowest. You don't have to stop and think that because you're already okay. Right. You know, but it's kind of like chicken or the egg, you know, all of these verses can help bring you to this point where your default positioning is loving kindness and compassion, giving and taking all the time. Or you start from there and then you need to amplify it by kind of pulling in the knowledge of these other verses. You know, so they reinforce each other, but for sure, verse seven is like you're walking around daily life practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, both on and off the cushion. Yeah, That's and it, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, it's, it's one that, you know, is famous for being able to bring into daily life. Because you can be in conversation with someone, they can be talking to you, and you can feel your stress come up a tiny bit. And then you feel that you know, uncomfortable feeling and you give it to your self-cherishing thought, dissolve it and relax back into spacious awareness. And you're still just talking, <laughs> you know, listening. And then you're, you know, seeing their distress, seeing their stress, seeing kind of, oh, they're not quite grounded. And you're just kind of breathing out kindness, compassion, acceptance, just kind of flooding them with light. But you're still just talking. No one knows what you're doing in your head, you know. Um, you know, a lot of us are, are famous for doing this in like shopping malls and, you know, queues at grocery stores, you know, when there's a tense and agitated line of some kind, breathing in the tension of the whole line and breathing out, you know, all of the relaxation and relief, then you become relaxed and have relief as a byproduct. And you've probably brought a lot of friendliness to the line. You know, so it's a fun experiment. Like sometimes if you're doing this in public, the energy will shift around you and strangers will start talking to each other because you've somehow like settled the atmosphere a little bit just by you not adding stress to it. It's fun. Well, yeah, Laura? Um, for, um, this is Lodong, right? Uh, yes. When given and taken. Um, Sometimes when I when uh, when you have some kind of sickness and you feel so weak, um, for me if that's happened because I have a problem with that. I can't. I, I like visualize something bad come to me and out. Like so, I have uh, some some kind of trick to do for for myself to famil familiarization. And, um, but sometimes when I'm very sick, I can do it because I say me and other sentient beings, we are all like, we have a sickness and I give that, I take that and I give like goodness. But uh, sometimes when I'm like kind of good in uh, physically, I'm like healthy. Uh, like I imagine myself like oxygen and like a tree. Yeah, but this is so pleasant for myself, but I don't know if it's really low down or something that just I invented. Well, you know, <laughs> look, like, I'll, I'll put up, I'll put up the slide and let's just kind of, you know, refresh. And um, it, it's Tonglen giving and taking is the heart of low Jong, right? So low Jong in general is these thought transformation teachings. And they all emphasize Tonglen at some point in the practices or the verses. And the reason for it is it develops bodhicitta, right? So, you know, thought transformation emphasizes Tonglen, which develops bodhicitta. This is your kind of like summary of the premise. You know, bodhicitta is the mind that seeks enlightenment. So if your practice, whatever you're doing as a tree, as a filtration system, as a whatever, is moving your heart towards enlightenment, then excellent, do that. <laughs> you know, it's excellent, do that. And, you know, theoretically and, you know, eventually we want to have the two bodhicittas, not just conventional bodhicitta that wishes to become enlightened for the benefit of all sentient beings, but that qualified by or imbued with um, the wisdom of emptiness. 
yeah, that understands that everything lacks inherent existence. So, you know, that's, it's going to take a while, but we know where we're going at least, and then we can kind of tidy it up and refine it as time goes by. So, you know, Tonglen, you can kind of you go through these that we talked about last week, you know, looking at the disadvantages of self-cherishing and the advantages of cherishing others and, you know, deciding to do so. And then deciding to do so, you do this Tonglen practice. So it can go with the breath. You know, you connect with giving on the out breath, visualizing golden light. And the kind of heart of that is loving kindness offering your past, present, and future happiness. And then connect with taking on the in-breath, and you visualize black smoke. And with compassion, you take the past, present, and future suffering of yourself and others. And so you're just cycling through and cycling through. And when you're taking the suffering, you're taking it onto the harm giver. You're not taking it on to yourself as a whole or your mental continuum. You're giving it to the harm giver, making the harm giver weaker. The harm giver is your self-cherishing attitude. You know, so it's, it's something that is ultimately liberating you as well as making you much more useful, kind for sentient beings. You know, so yes, well, yucky black, it, but it's, uh, it's good for you. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's bad. It's bad for the um, self cherishing self. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's what perfect. I was missing. That is my self cherishing that was deciding Stop. that it's not good. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't recognize that. Thank you so much. No problem. Well, we'll take. Let's take a five minute break, and then we'll do the last verse and the last meditation. While we uh, wait for the others to assemble, do you have any um, randoms, random questions while we wait for people to come back? I do, yes. yes. Mm. Yeah, hit me. Um, in the verse, what is it? When someone whom I have benefited. Yep. Um, the line gives me a terrible harm, always makes me curious because I know every word is chosen. Yeah. It sounds like it's handed to me on a plate rather than does me a terrible harm. Is yeah. there a nuance there or just language? Well, that translation is Lama Zopa Rinpoche, so that is not by accident. Um, no, no. That is not by accident. I um, Well, let me just look and make sure that it's translated the same way everywhere um because it might not be actually i'm just so used to Rinpoche's version let's see i'm looking at tupton jimpa's let's see eight session mind training even if one whom i have hoped or in whom i have placed great hope gravely mistreats me in hurtful ways so there's a little bit of a difference there. Gravely mistreats me in hurtful ways. I will train myself yes. to view him as my sublime teacher. Yes. So here it looks like this is a this is probably the direct word translation. And yes. Lama Zopa Rinpoche is more likely to give a meaning translation. Yeah. So okay. just like um, like verse one, with the wish to achieve the highest aim, which surpasses even a wish fulfilling gem. I will train myself to at all times, cherish every sentient being as supreme. Lama Zopa says, Lama Zopa says, I will train to, um, to derive benefit from, right? The word from is not in other translations. So I think, you know, again and again, Rinpoche adjusts to a translation that in a way combines the commentary and mm -hmm. is again and again seeing sentient beings as kind. And if you ever go to class with Rinpoche, it's a big theme, training to see the kindness of sentient beings. Mm -hmm. And it's again that thing where they don't have to intend to be kind for it to be a kindness. Mm -hmm. You know, and so he's always just so precious, so precious, so kind, so kind. Sentient beings are so kind, so precious. And that training means that he sees sentient beings with such a respect, mm -hmm. you know, even the tiniest, tiniest ant. So I'm guessing that when he translates the eight verses in this way, it's again, this invitation 
to feel the reverence and to feel, oh, they've gifted me <laughs> this terrible I was going to say, I, I can hear his voice now and I can see it now as being a gift being given. So yeah. that, that's wonderful. That that changes the way I see it now. Yep. That's very good. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Rinpoche. Yeah, sentient beings have gifted us with terrible harms. And we're like, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> yeah, that so makes so much sense now. Okay. Yeah, and, and the, you'll find that with most Rinpoche commentaries or most Rinpoche oh. translations, because even when he speaks, you can tell his grammar is not showing the aspect of perfect grammar, but mm -hmm. he does yeah. understand English very well. Like yeah. he, he has a fluency in his understanding of English. And yes. so he often brings in the commentary explanation to his translations into English. And then mm -hmm. his um, attendants help him with grammar. Yeah. So it's, yeah, they're, they're interesting, his translations. I appreciate them whenever I find them really. Yeah, that's taken it to a whole new level now. Yeah, yeah, it's true. I'm glad that you highlighted that. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so I think we're all back. Um, let's just revive our motivation for a sec. Getting back into it. Last verse, which is the antidote to self-grasping, not just self-cherishing. So verse eight reads, undefiled by the stains of the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns. May I, by perceiving all phenomena as illusory, be released from the bondage of attachment. So there's two components, right? Undefiled by the stains or the habit or the appearances, but the key word superstitions, usually in Tibetan, when you see superstition, it's nomtok which sometimes can be translated just as conception. But the underlying understanding is that all conceptions for us have a mistaken appearance. So it's interesting to think everything really that is agitated in our mind is coming from a superstition, you know, not just don't walk under ladders superstitions, but kind of an everyday constant superstitious way of seeing the world because of our innate grasping at inherent existence. So trying not to be, I guess, tempted or co-opted or drawn off course by the eight worldly concerns, may we train in seeing all phenomena as illusory. And by doing that, unhook ourselves or be released from kind of the glue of attachment or being stuck to samsara through attachment, craving and grasping. So here is kind of our invitation to move into the wisdom category of the teachings while not leaving behind the method side of the teachings. So we first have to unpack a little bit, what are the eight worldly concerns? So, you know, just off the top of your head in no particular order, what are the eight worldly concerns? I was just reading up on this because it's Dakey's next teaching. So uh, happiness, praise, gain, um, good reputation, all the things that we think will make us happy. And then their opposites, the things that really annoy us are the criticism, um, loss, uh, poor reputation, um, things like that. Yeah, yeah, well summarized. Yeah, exactly. And they're superstitions because we believe, <laughs> right? We believe that the ones we hope for and seek will be happiness, yeah? We really are quite convinced that if we have comfort and pleasure, if we have, we have acquisition or gaining or whatever, you know, sort of abundance, if we have pleasant words said to us, if we have a good reputation, that those are the ingredients for happiness. So pursuing them 100% is a good plan. That's a superstition, right? And it's also a superstition to think if you're uncomfortable or in pain, if you've lost something or someone or a situation, if you're criticized, or if you have a bad reputation or defamation, 
that those are the ingredients for suffering and sadness. And if you have them, you will definitely have suffering and sadness. And so they are to be avoided at all costs is a superstition. And that is a very excellent way of framing our everyday life because most of the day we believe our superstition. And there's a practical side, you know, we don't want to be chasing the conditions for suffering, but we're really trying to break the spell. Yeah. So first we look at the eight worldly concerns and see the way in which basing our life plans and all of our goals on them is not a great idea. I should have made the font larger, I apologize. So, you know, you can frame them in a couple of ways. Um, the eight worldly concerns, preoccupations, sometimes they're called the eight worldly winds or samsaric dharmas. Um, basically, hope for happiness, fear of suffering, hope for fame, fear of insignificance, hope for praise, fear of blame, hope for gain, fear of loss. So they're pairs of attachment and aversion. They're neurotic hope and fear. So if you wanna see them as a nice tidy list of eight, we can look at it this way, but it's easiest to remember them in terms of pairs of basically push and pull. And all of the day, all of the life, things feel too much or not enough. And we're trying to, you know, fix it. This is too much, let's push it away. This is not enough, let's pull more towards. And there's this kind of hunger and agitation and then feeling too full and needing to recover and in a million different ways in the course of a day, just kind of leaning in and pulling away. And the mind is agitated all day, every day by these. So if our Dharma practice is motivated by these, it's not Dharma practice. If our Dharma practice is motivated by these, it will just be one more cause for samsara. So the way to break the spell is to see illusion as illusion by reminding yourself that none of these are always necessarily so. Yeah, so you can do this. We'll do it first just conversationally, and then we'll do it as a meditation. So conversationally, let's take one pair, wanting pleasure, comfort, ease, not wanting discomfort, suffering, pain. Yeah, that. <laughs> when is it the case that having comfort and having, you know, pleasure is not so good? We assume it's good, we chase it because we think it's happiness. When is it not? Yeah. When I'm having a comfortable what? day, I get yeah. very little love. Very little done. Yep. Yeah. Comfort equals complacent. Not always, but sometimes, right? We're just trying to like break the always feeling. Yeah. We're like, sometimes comfort is good. Sometimes pleasure is good. We don't have to be not having it. Pleasure is fine. It's the result of positive karma ripening. Enjoy it. The problem is the chase, right? The problem is the desperation and the hunger right? So what happens on a day that you're focused on getting pleasure? <laughs> That's not so good. As opposed to a day where you enjoy pleasure when it comes, but you're not in the chase. If I'm having a day where I need to chase feeling good, I usually eat too much because that's yeah. the simplest thing to do is the kitchen's yeah. just there. I will but bring the day. happiness here. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. I will have happiness here. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. the most human thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. does, yeah does, it mean you, does it mean you become distracted when you are chasing um, pleasure or fearing getting blamed or whatever else? So it's the distraction um, from the, the Dharma or whatever you're meant to be doing. To, to seek enlightenment and, and peace? Certainly that's a huge piece, yeah. Because of the panic of needing or the panic of avoiding, then you're distracted and you might 
hurt yourself and hurt others and not even notice it because you're just in tunnel vision. Yeah, that's one piece for sure, for sure. And, you know, take, taking the pleasure example, what do we do to other people if we're in pleasure seeking mode? We objectify them. You are supposed to make me feel good. Yeah, you say the things I want you to say, do it now. Make the things I want you to make, do it now. Be the entertaining version, the patient version, the listening version. Do the things what I like, object, <laughs> otherwise known as a human who I love, but today, object, right? We make them into objects, right? We stop seeing their humanity. Yeah, we commodify the humans in our life. Maybe even our pets, right? Like normally you're very nice to your pet, pet, pet. You know, the cat leans in, you pet them more. On a, you know, grasping day, you're like, you will have a cuddle whether you like it or not. I shall take you. <laughs> you know, and the cat's like, oh, all right, apparently. <laughs> you know, right? We've, we've forgotten that they're a sentient being and they've, we've made them into a stuffed toy. And, you know, you will give me comfort, sentient being. Squish. <laughs> you know, right? It makes us not notice how our cravings impact other people. Yeah. So when is suffering not bad, right? When is a little bit of pain, a little bit of discomfort, not the worst thing in the world? Our superstitions say it must be avoided at all costs. And of course, generally, that's a good idea. But what about when it gets into that like panicked, I need to get away from it. How can we break the spell of that kind of panic by reminding ourselves of times when discomfort has actually been useful? I, I mean, I think about when I quit drinking, I didn't come to that decision because everything was going extremely well. And uh, all of the all of the changes that have been transformational in my life have been because I can't continue down a path that I've that I've been on. The, the suffering has been much more useful than my, in my life than than comfort. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You weren't you weren't like feeling your liver and going, oh, you're really healthy and doing quite yeah. well. You're not distended at all. I'll just stop right. while I'm ahead. <laughs> yeah. I enjoy alienating people and making a fool of myself. So that's pleasurable. So I'll keep doing that now. Yep. Yep. And I mean, even something as simple as like exercise is initially the first five minutes of exercise particularly comfortable. It is not for me. I don't know about you guys, but I'm kind of like, uh, you know, stiff and like, all right, go for a walk. Come on. You've got to form aggregate. You've got to keep it moving. Come on. You know, like you want to live as long as you can so you can practice the Dharma, go for a walk, you know, and then, uh, <laughs> you know, it's not comfortable, but it's good, you know, and then you warm up and it's fine, but, you know, discomfort as a, as something that triggers fear or panic or avoidance, you know, this is what it does when we've believed the eight worldly concerns and we're trying to soften the edges of everything all the time. And then it actually makes it worse. You know, it's like scratching an itch. You know, if you had the itch and you're like, oh, I have an itch. Anyway, let's look over here. Let's read something. You forget about it. But if you're like, oh, I have an itch, I must itch it, I must itch it, then it spreads it all around and then it's just like really on your mind, you know? It, so we wanna kind of look at what is our relationship to pleasure and pain? Because when we're centered and when we're focused on our path, pleasure is useful, pain is useful, right? When we're not centered on our path, there's a chase or a run. We're running away from or we're chasing something and we are not focused on what's in front of us. And our whole life just kind of passes us by because the whole day is spent trying to get our senses to make us happy. You know, so we'll read something or look at something or watch something until our eyes are bored or tired. 
then we'll listen to something until our ears are bored or tired. Then we'll taste something until we're too full. And then we'll have a bath or a shower. We'll, you know, change into something more comfy clothes or, you know, you just kind of rotating through your senses, trying to get them to give you entertainment or stimulation. You know, you're just doing a senses rotation. Yeah, you're like, hmm, maybe I should go out and smell the flowers. That was nice. Maybe I should go eat something. Hmm, that was nice. Maybe I should read this book. That was nice. Maybe I should do this. That was nice, you know, and you're just kind of not present. Yeah. Or you have something worrying you and aggravating you and you're distracting yourself, you know, so you're avoiding the pain of your mind or there's a pain in your body and you're freaked out about it. And so you're trying to self-soothe using various methods that are human and understandable, but ultimately not useful in the long run, you know? And a lot of our day is trying to kind of get the chemicals in our body at a good place, you know? That's the root of a lot of addictions, right? It's just trying to get the chemicals right because we're not feeling good and totally human, totally understandable but more efficient if we could just kind of unpack our relationship with pain and discomfort, you know? So that's just even the first pair. We have to break the spell, right? We're not saying chase pain, avoid pleasure. We're not saying that. We're saying break the spell that says one is necessarily good and the other is necessarily bad because that's not always true. Yeah, it's an illusion. And the very things that make you happy that seem to make you happy are conditions they're not causes they're not reliable and the things that seem to make you suffer are conditions they're not causes they don't do it in and of themselves yeah if someone saying something unkind to you was the cause of your suffering then they could say it on any number of days and it would feel exactly the same way you know, if someone said to you, you're so stupid on a day you felt stupid, it's a wound and you're like, I know, I've been found out, you know, on a day you're feeling confident and you're feeling competent, you're like, I'm not, but I see how you can think that, you know, on a day that you're feeling arrogant, you might, you know, need to respond with some aggressiveness, you know, like the same words land differently day by day time of day by time of day, right? If you know that the person yelling is having a rough day themselves, you don't take them so seriously, etc. right? So the superstitions of the eight worldly concerns keep reinforcing our belief that our own opinions are accurate and worth living by. They make us believe everything we think rather than challenging the habit energy behind them. So then gain and loss, you unpack just the same way. Is it always good to get what you want or who you want or what you want? Is that always good? <laughs> you know, and you think in your life, I wanted that, I got that, but it turned out not so good. Hmm, <laughs> right? Whatever it was, you know? Even if it was just, you got a new computer, you needed a new computer, you planned on it, it finally came. And now you have to learn how to use a whole new operating system and it's got all these weird updates to do. And now you have to figure out where different things are located and it's a whole thing. And you missed your old computer, even though it was slow. <laughs> Cause at least you knew how that one worked, <laughs> whatever, right? So you got what you wanted and it wasn't what you needed. Remember a time, you know, where you got the job you wanted but it turned out to be a nightmare or you got the person you wanted and it turned out to not go the way you thought and that is good to remember because then the next time you're hungry craving for it i need to get this because that will be happiness you have a moment's pause that says are you sure in and of itself yeah and you know losing not always bad right one less thing to look after one less thing to worry about <laughs> you know i think gain and loss is something that we've probably had to look at in our life already before even meeting the dharma just kind of what's an, what's a way to look at getting 
and what's a way of losing, you know, these kind of thoughts we've probably had in some way or another, but do we unpack praise and criticism or reputation as head on? Because I think in a normal day, we do have an expectation that if people speak to us in a pleasant, polite, validating way, that that is necessary for our happiness, right? And it's not, it's a bonus. And in a perfect society, people would be polite and validating and kind, and we want that. And we want to hold people to a standard in a gentle way. But is it true that people validating you are giving you happiness? You know? Before you get the validation, you can be quite convinced that if someone would just recognize my good work, I would feel better and keep doing it. And sometimes that is true. And sometimes someone will validate you and you'll think, yeah, but what else? <laughs> More please, from another angle, again, you know? Or you'll think, oh no, I'm not that great. Now that they say that, I'm feeling crap. You know, like, and it have a million different impacts on your mind. Before you get it though, you really crave it. You're like, oh, I wish someone just appreciated me. You know, why do people validate us? Sometimes they see our good qualities and want to celebrate them. Sometimes they're being manipulative and want something, <laughs> right? It's not like the good words are good in and of themselves, right? Um, so you're having healthy skepticism that knows people have their own agenda for saying what they say. I don't need to take it personally when it's good. I don't need to take it personally when it's bad, even when it's directed to me personally. <laughs> it's not really ever personal. You know, you already know that, you know, that's the thing with these eight worldly concerns. You already know that, but you have to remember on purpose because if you don't remember on purpose, you'll buy into the superstition in daily life, just like you always did. You know, you, if you had a good friend talking about an issue, you would tell them the same stuff, not even knowing you were talking about the illusion of the eight worldly concerns. You know, you'd give them sound advice, helping them see it from another perspective and reframing it in some way. You know, that's the thing is like, this is not out of the realm of common sense. And yet it's like, we are so hardwired to believe the illusion. That's why we have to proactively remind ourselves of our own wisdom. Yeah, on purpose again and again. So reputation is maybe the hardest one because Probably no one says to themselves, I want to be famous. I mean, maybe Generation Z, I don't know, bless their hearts. <laughs> they all want to be famous. But, you know, probably at this stage in our life, we're like, I'd rather not, actually. <laughs> I like my quiet life, you know. Um, but we do want to be thought well of, right? We do want our peers to think well of us. And we do want people to speak well of us when we're not there. You know, if we were to walk in on a conversation, people talking about us, we would want to hear nice things, right? Which is reasonable and human. And we don't want to suffer a terrible blow to our reputation where everyone looks down on us and thinks that we're incompetent or, I don't know, unethical or problematic in some way. We don't want to be thought poorly of. And that's reasonable on one level. But if you're banking your life on it, what does it do to you? And how much control do you actually have? And why do you say that you need it? You know, so you want to really consciously look at what's the disadvantage of being thought well of? <laughs> yeah. Is there any disadvantage of being thought well of and people liking you and thinking you're wonderful and amazing? What's a disadvantage? You have to think of one. Yep, you, you can uh be a kind of slave of that mindset wanting yeah. like a hungry ghost yeah. yeah definitely yeah and it's never enough yeah never Once enough you and you know you you would may maybe do things that it's not ethical to have a good for certain community you never know yeah exactly yeah exactly yeah, Margo, 
Yeah, I suppose the disadvantage might be that you may at some time <laughs> probably disappoint them. So, <laughs> you know, it's kind of built in, isn't it? Yeah, you will fall off that pedestal mm. or they will knock you off of it. Yeah, yeah. Do you know, Yenton, while I've got you there, sometimes speaking of good reputation, when I've read the odd obituary, which you do as you get older, um, and I sometimes think, oh, I hope people say nice things about me, you know, and you sort of plan your own um, <laughs> memorial service and think, what might they say that's nice? <laughs> And then you realize they only say the nice bits. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And their family is like, if they only knew. <laughs> that's right. They conveniently forget the others. Yeah. Yeah. My, my mom and I were just writing an obituary recently <laughs> and thinking that like, well, here's what we're going to say. <laughs> and that's all true, but it's not the whole story. Um, look, I think a really interesting one is to think how much time is demanded of you when people think you're it. You know, when they think that you're the one to turn to, they think that you're the one that's amazing, that's, you know, whatever, beneficial in some way, how much time is demanded of you? Yeah, as opposed to if you had a terrible reputation, how much time you'd have to yourself to do whatever you want, <laughs> you know, to study what you want, to pursue what you want. If you have a good reputation, are you sure why people want to be close to you? Is it proximity to good reputation or is it a genuine affection and appreciation of you? If people are close to you when you have a terrible reputation, you know those are some good friends they're in it for the long run, right? When everyone thinks that you're trash and they still love you, that's a good friend, right? So it's hard to know if you've got a good reputation, if people are just with you for the association. You know, think of like poor famous people, like actually famous people, that, that is rough. How are they ever gonna know who to trust, right? No wonder so many of them turn to drugs and alcohol because it's just like crazy. Yeah, and all of that observation. The more, the more known you are, the more you open yourself up to criticism as well, right? And the thing is, is wanting and seeking good reputation, it's something that is actually very ephemeral and intangible, and you can't really control all the moving parts because the moving parts are other people. You know, and we're all subject to the winds of change, you know, and different ideas about what is a suitable behavior and what isn't. Who's going to get your sense of humor and who's going to be offended by it? You know, who's going to appreciate your way of communicating and who's going to be uh, feeling it's obnoxious? You know, like you cannot control how everything lands. You know, so seeking that good reputation not always a good thing. In fact, I would argue really never a good thing. Having one can be useful, chasing one not. Yeah, if you have one, maybe you can use it to be of benefit to others, but needing it, holding on to it, being tight about it, it, it actually can make you paralyzed. How do you even act to make sure no one thinks badly of you? Or it can make you overact, not be paralyzed, but like, you know, mess around in people's business and try and check and always seek validation and trying to manage and put out fires. And you're just running around like a chook with your head cut off, trying to manage everyone's expectations and keep them loving you. You know, like what a headache. You know? So then you think of the advantages of not being thought well of, as I mentioned, you know, who your friends are, that's a classic. But what are some other like benefits of if people don't think well of you, if you're underestimated, if you're disliked, what's a benefit? Break the spell. If you see it and you can bear it well, then you stop it there, it won't reoccur. Yeah. That sort of thing, yeah, which yeah. is good. 
yeah yeah definitely that definitely that it frees up a lot of time you know definitely. if you people aren't asking you to take on things or do things or you know yeah in terms of of if if you're not viewed as a competent person yeah yeah exactly responsibilities are less asks you to help them with so yeah yeah exactly exactly it, you know it can also make you feel connected to a group of people that you wouldn't otherwise feel connected to you know i was thinking about my um my uncle just recently passed away and he was only in his 50s and he was my youngest uncle and he was the musician and the mascot and the joyful one and also the one with you know many chemical dependency issues and schizophrenia and various things like that but he was you know like the heart of our family because he was the joyful one that brought the music and the laughs right and i was thinking about how objectively he had no good reputation right? He didn't go to college. He didn't have a job. He lived off of disability. He lived in a trailer that was falling down. He drank too much. He probably smoked meth. I don't know what he got up to in there. A series of dodgy choices that all make sense given his, you know, background and his mental illness. And he had the lowest reputation of anyone in the family, probably. From the outside, you would call him the black sheep, but he was the heart he was the one everyone felt safe with. You know, you could go into his messy trailer and put your feet down anywhere. You didn't worry about knocking over some precious knickknack, <laughs> you know? Like you weren't gonna break the nice china, right? You could just put your feet anywhere. You could just relax and flop, you know? You know that feeling like if you're in a fancy person's house and you're kind of like, I don't wanna break anything, you're kind of tiptoeing around. But if you're at your messy friend's house, there's a level of just chill you know, I can put my coat here, doesn't matter. It's going to get dog hair on it. Who cares? I can put my glass here. What's a coaster? Who cares about coasters? You know, there's just kind of a, a relaxation. Um, and so to kind of think that people that are not, you know, chasing reputation that might even have a bad reputation also can create an atmosphere around themselves where no one feels like they have to worry about reputation either right? You just live and be and connect. Yeah, I mean, don't we all have like the messy family member or the messy friend who is just like, their house is chaos, and you don't know how they live that way. But you love them. And when you're there, you're kind of like, cool, chaos, whatever. <laughs> right? You just relax into it. And you go back home, and you might feel a need to clean your house more than usual, because you're kind of like, wow, that was chaos, I have to put some order in my life. But, you know, when you're with them, it's like this beautiful experience of just doesn't matter. Yeah. And I think about all those meditators in the hills of Dharamsala who are just quietly getting enlightened without anybody noticing, you know, in their little mud caves, their little mud huts with their barley flour and their, you know, spring water and occasional cheese, you know, just quietly getting enlightened, getting the job done. Yeah, and no one is clapping, no one is celebrating, no one even knows to ask them to teach because they're so quiet. But then once they're enlightened, they can emanate and manifest in a million different ways to benefit sentient beings. Just quietly getting the job done. You know, and maybe some of the teachers with the biggest names and the biggest followings might just be very regular people with a good education maybe not even a good education, <laughs> but now they have to maintain the name. You know, the pressure of keeping the title and the name and being impressive and whatever, be, you know, the pressure to be profound. <laughs> Can you imagine how horrible, right? Or to feel that every word you say is gonna be interpreted in this special dharmic way. Every word you just said, let's have a break a little earlier today. Now everyone's going, <gasps> break earlier. What does that mean? We should take breaks earlier in our meditation in general. Now forever after in the schedule of the center, we should always have this timetable, you know, and it goes into this whole crazy thing of over-interpretation. Can you imagine the pressure? Yuck. 
So you, you get the idea, right? Having the worldly concerns is totally normal, is totally natural. And on one level, they make sense. Being driven by them kills our spiritual path. Being driven by them kills the present moment. And being driven by them reinforces the illusion of the self that isn't there at all, not even conventionally. There is a self, but not the self that the eight worldly concerns is trying to protect and promote. That one is the pretender. That one is the troublemaker. You know, so the one that's chasing and running is like a puff of smoke. Yeah. The self that is there is just that which is labeled on the collection. Yeah. So just that what is left, you know, what is placed on the connection, on the collection of parts is, it feels additional to the parts, but it's not. Or it feels in control of the parts, and it's not. Yeah. That one that feels kind of central or holding or extra, that one is the one that the eight worldly concerns is, you know, working with all the time, trying to get its needs met, which is why its needs can never be met because it was never there, right? It was never there. Kind of like chasing a shadow. You're trying to feed a shadow, right? Yeah, or like capture an echo. It's never gonna work. 